I thought he was the one. We all thought he was the one. Everyone did. My time has not yet come. That's what he would say over and over to me. My time has not yet come. Are you kidding me? He was raising people from the dead for crying out loud. He was healing the blind, producing food out of thin air. My time has not yet come. So I forced his hand. I made his time come. Things needed to push, and I was the only one that had the courage to do it. We were all up there eating. We were all up there. He looks across the table to me, and he says, get on with it. How, how did he know what I was going to do? Because when he spoke, and you were there in his presence, there was no doubt in anyone's mind, he was the one. What have I done? For a good Friday service and, and, and looking, focusing really on, on Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. And I don't know about you, if you were here, it, it was special. It was special because we, we teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter through God's word. That's what we do right now. We're in the, the book of Luke. And we're in Luke chapter 22 on Friday night is, is where, when we taught 22. If you, if you look at it, if you read there, you can turn there now. It's just amazing that chapter 22 of Luke deals with Judas agreeing to betray Jesus. And then it deals with what is called the Last Supper. And we studied that in detail, how the Last Supper was actually a Passover, a Jewish Passover service or, or meal, looking forward, looking back on how the lambs died to free the Israelites from Egypt, but looking forward to the lamb that would die on the cross. And what Jesus did at that time is he took that Passover meal and he established a new covenant with bread representing his body, and, and wine, the cup, representing his blood. And it was amazing to me that, that that's what we studied on Friday night. That's where we were. And, and looking at that, I, I kept coming back to Judas. And, and, and it's, it's interesting. The verses, we've been here in this section for the past few weeks. We keep coming back to Jesus' daily schedule. This is, this is what would be on his iPhone, you know, for his calendar, right? That was funny. Second service didn't laugh at it either, all right? Neither did first, but verse 37 of chapter 21. This is Jesus' daily calendar. Each day, this is his last week of life on earth. This is what he did. Each day he was teaching at the temple. And each evening he went out to spend the night on the hill called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to hear him at the temple. And so why did they need Jesus? You know, they, they, Judas, excuse me. The Jewish leaders, they wanted to kill Jesus. But his schedule was always surrounded by people. In the daytime, he'd be found here at the temple, in the temple courts, teaching, surrounded by crowds. They gathered early in the morning so that when he got there, they could hear him teach. And they were with him all day. Well, they couldn't arrest him there because if they arrested Jesus there, the crowds would, would riot. But then at night, he went up to the Mount of Olives. You can see the arrow there pointing to the Mount of Olives. That's where he was camped. 
Now, he wasn't the only one camped there. Josephus, Josephus is a non-Christian Jewish historian from the first century and writes a bunch about Jesus. So Josephus tells us that during the Passover week, the population of Jerusalem, which is about one million people, would swell by two million people. So the hills surrounding the city would be full of people camping. So Jesus' disciples standing up there on the Mount of Olives, they weren't alone. They were surrounded by people. So they couldn't arrest him there. They couldn't arrest him in the temple because they'd start a riot. They couldn't arrest him up at the Mount of Olives because of all the people camped up there. They had to figure out a place to arrest him when he was alone. Who would know when Jesus would be alone? His disciples. So when Judas comes and agrees to turn in Jesus, Judas would know when Jesus would be alone away from the crowds. And it's when he went to the small garden to pray. Now, the first blank on your notes, it's on the app. I'd encourage you to download the app. Just search for Calvary Mac in the app store and click on the bulletin notes, and, and you can follow in there. I encourage you that today because we're going to jump all over Scripture this morning. We also have the notes in the bulletin, but the, the first blank on your notes there is this. Is Judas knew the one place Jesus would be alone, away from the crowds, in a, sm- a small garden Jesus went to in order to pray. Ironically, Judas would use Jesus' prayer life against him. Judas was completely spiritually blind. He didn't realize his view was distorted. We've been talking a lot about eyesight lately, primarily because if you've been around here at Calvary Mac, you know that I haven't had glasses until a month ago. (laughs) I haven't been to the optometrist in 20 years because I always had 20-20 vision. And then I got glasses. (laughs) Sight is the ability to see. But we're not going to be talking about physical sight today. We're going to be talking about spiritual sight. Spiritual sight is the ability to see that God is working. So even when the world is blurry. The world's pretty blurry right now. It's gotten a lot blurrier over the past couple of years. Things are tough. And when life is hard and doesn't seem to make sense, things are falling apart at work, things are falling apart in your family, things are falling apart financially. I mean, there was a study last week that said the average family needs $500 more a month just to keep up with inflation. Things are blurry right now. Well, spiritual sight makes everything clear. The problem is is that what we learned on Friday at the Good Friday service is that spiritual blindness, spiritual blindness, it's deadly. But what we're going to discover this morning is that the challenge with spiritual blindness is that it consistently goes undiagnosed. People are deceived into presuming They can see when the reality is they are utterly blind. And so what we're going to do this morning for Easter, for for Resurrection Sunday, is we're going to do an eye exam, everybody. (laughs) And first, we're going to do an eye exam on Judas. And we're going to look at different points in his life before the resurrection of Christ and then after And we're going to look into his life to diagnose how his view is distorted. And then we're going to find the right prescription. And what we're going to find is that prescription is that hope is only found by looking to Jesus. Lord, we we desire to hear your voice this morning. Only you can transform hearts and eloquent speech can't do it. But your spirit, Lord, we're all here by your hand, by your purpose. And I pray, Lord, that we would be open to what you want to do. Lord, that can't happen through an eloquent speech or superior wisdom, but only through a demonstration of your Spirit's power so that our faith doesn't rest upon man, but instead upon your power. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we'll start again in Luke chapter 22, where we're at in our study. Verse 39. 
Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. All of his disciples except one, Judas. He's not with them anymore. He left. What just finished was what we call the Last Supper which was the last Passover looking forward to the Messiah, the first Lord's Supper. So that was in town, but now it's, it's nighttime. And as usual, this has been his schedule. He's been teaching all day in the temple courts. They had the last supper. Now they're heading up to camp, but they stop because this is what Jesus did for some time alone between Jesus and his father. They go to the garden of Gethsemane. Now, Here's the thing, you know, I, I always try to show pictures or archaeological evidence. That's an actual picture from the Garden of Gethsemane. And if you've been there, you know that there's very good evidence. They've tried to date these trees. Many of them are hollow inside, but with the rings they can count, they're at least a thousand years old. There's estimates that many of several of these tree, at least trees, at least four of them, were actually trees in the garden when Jesus prayed there. This is real. This is not mythology. And if they're not the actual trees, they grew out like nursing trees from those trees. The garden is still there where all this happens. And to pick up the story, we're going to go to verse 1 of, chapter, of John chapter 18. And so this is Jesus, you know, he's just finished that last supper. And when Jesus had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples, except for Judas, who's gone, and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side, there was a garden. That's the garden. We just saw a picture of it and where it was, where it is. And he, is, he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place. Because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the garden carrying a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Now, when I, I went to the optometrist for the first time in 20 years, because of course I don't need to go to the eye doctor, <laughs> they put this weird looking thing on me. <laughs> kind of looks like Darth Vader. I felt like Darth Vader. And, and you know, it kind of swivels over and they, they, they put it in front of you. This thing is actually called a phoropter. <laughs> Do you know that? It's called a phoropter. And what the phoropter does is the first thing they do is that they make everything blurry. And then they use different lenses and tools and measurements to figure out just how bad your eyesight is, how it's off. And so the next blank on your notes there, a phoropter uses various lenses and tools to determine how distorted a person's view is so they can determine the prescription. When I thought I passed with flying colors, you know, I'm like looking through the phoropter, I'm like, you know, all this, you know, this A, B, whatever, reading the letters. And then they get done, they're like, Brian, you need a prescription. I literally was like, but I got all the letters right. And they're like, no, you didn't. And they were able to determine that from the phoropter. So that's what we're going to use. It's kind of a spiritual phoropter. We're going to make everything blurry here, looking into what Judas' spiritual eyesight was. Well, here's the first reading from the spiritual phoropter we're looking at this morning, is trusting yourself. Self-trust. Trust self. You know, Judas has become disillusioned by Jesus. Interesting that, you know, we're going through the book of Luke normally on Sunday morning. And the book of Luke was written from Luke to his friend Theophilus, who was a believer in Jesus, but he had become disillusioned, likely because of all the persecution going on under Nero. And so Luke writes him this book, researched it with eyewitnesses so that Theophilus can know what he's been told about Jesus is true. Well, here's another person disillusioned with Jesus, and there's a reason why. Is as you look at, at Judas, here's the context. It's the Roman Empire. The Jewish nation, it was part of the Roman Empire. We've compared it here in our study 
to the invasion of the Ukraine by the, by the Russians, where the Romans came in, invaded, and took over as an occupying force in the Jewish nation. We compared it to the Ukrainians and this famous picture from early on in the war, this Ukrainian grandmother going up and scolding a Russian soldier. What are you doing? We compared that to how the Jewish people, they hated the Romans because the Romans were an occupying army. Well, Judas hated the Romans. And he hears about Jesus It's like the Messiah is here, finally. The Messiah, the Savior is here. And he's going to destroy the Romans, get them out, kick them out of Israel. He's going to establish his throne in Jerusalem, in the temple, and rule the world from Jerusalem. One problem. What we studied two weeks ago in chapter 21 of Luke is that Jesus just said, Jerusalem's about to be destroyed. And it came true in 70 AD, by the way. Jesus predicted it 40 years in advance. He said, invading army, not one stone. They're going to throw all the stones of the temple down. Not one stone will be left. And Judas hears this. He's like, how can that be? You know, that didn't make any sense to Judas. You know, Judas thought he knew who Jesus was, but Jesus wasn't the Jesus he thought Jesus should be. And there's a lot of people who have an image of who Jesus is and they're completely spiritually blind. Jesus isn't who we say he is. Jesus is who God's word says he is. But so often we trust ourselves because we, we think we know what's best. You know, we think about this and, oh, we just think we're so wise. My question to you is a question I ask myself, how's that working out for you? Our entire society is built upon self-trust. How's it working right now? Our society's divided. Hate. Everywhere. World's in chaos. Well, Judas placed his hope in his own intellect rather than God's sovereign plan. He forced his own will into the situation and as a result became the agent through which Satan killed the Son of God. You know, hope, hope, if you're looking for hope right now, it is not in trusting ourselves. It's not trusting some politician. Hope is only found in, by looking to Jesus, who he is, not who we want him to be. So for the next distorted lens, let's go to Matthew chapter 27. <coughs> I told you we'd be jumping around this morning. Here it is. Chapter 27, verse 3. Early in the morning, so all night they've been trying Jesus. He's been on trial. They arrested him in the garden. They took him to the chief priest's house. They've been trying him at night, which is completely illegal under Jewish law, but they want to try him and get him on a cross before the crowds wake up. If they can do that, then the the crowds won't riot. So early in the morning after that illegal trial, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans on how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Hands him over to the Romans. This would be like the Ukrainians trying some guy, and they can't kill him, so they take him to the the Russians and say, you kill him. So they bound him up, led him away, handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse. So after, after that illegal trial, you know, G- Judas, like that video said earlier, Judas is trying to force Jesus' hand, to force him to start establishing his kingdom. So in Judas' mind, he's like betraying Jesus, but he's kind of like pushing him out the road to, to get him to fly, to, to get him to start fighting back and become the Messiah that Judas wanted him to be. But all of a sudden, Jesus is now in the hands of the Romans? Judas hated the Romans. He's going to be killed. 
Well, he's seized with remorse, and that's our second reading. As we focus in, we look down, that second reading is regret. Seized with remorse. Can you relate? Those biggest regrets in, in your life, those mistakes you've made, those secret parts of your life that you're sure if other people knew what you've really done or how dark your heart really is, they wouldn't want to hang out with you. We all have regrets. But there's a difference between temporary regret and true repentance. The Apostle Paul, <coughs> excuse me, he writes about the difference between regret and repent, repentance when he, he writes a letter to the church at Corinth. It's actually a excuse me, the second letter he's written to them, it says this, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. So if it's godly sorrow and it leads you to repentance, all those regrets are wiped clean. But worldly sorrow brings death because it's temporary it doesn't actually lead to permanent change. Most of us are professionals at regret, but we are complete amateurs at repentance. Worldly sorrow may lead to regret, but not to heart, mind, and behavioral transformation. If you want to know how true that is, ask anybody who's ever tried to go on a diet. Now, full disclosure, I've gone on five diets this year. Each one of them has failed within 12 hours. <laughs> I've had two donuts this morning because we have free donuts downstairs. They're free. Those shouldn't count. The sugar and calories shouldn't count, right? Well, Judas regrets his decision to betray Jesus. He trusted himself. He regrets it because things didn't go according to plan. But his regret results from the weight of his guilt that overwhelms him. He wasn't looking for hope that's found in Jesus. He was looking for hope by forcing Jesus to be the Jesus he wanted him to be. The next distorted lens, here it is. When Judas, <clears throat> who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed an innocent man. What is that to us? They replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas took the money into the temple and left. So Judas, he's, he's so overwhelmed. You know, he has the 30 pieces of silver. I, I, I got here a bag. I put 30 pennies in it. So he has 30 pieces of silver. And it's, it's not that it's money. It's that this money represents his guilt. And so it's just the weight of it. And he, he, he realizes he made a mistake. He regrets it. You know, he trusted himself that he knows what's best. He, <coughs> excuse me, he regrets the mistake. Now he, he takes it and he tries to, you know, he tries to take it and he tries to like give it back. And, and that's the reading we get here. It's, it's willpower. So often we have guilt and it's just willpower. He's like, here, take it back, take it back. And they're like, hey, it's not our problem, dude. We already have Jesus. You go away. We don't care about you. They didn't care about G Judas. They cared that they had Jesus. So he's like, he has this. He's like, I got to get rid of this. And so often this is what we try to do is with our own strength, with our own willpower, we go and we just try to like, yeah, I'm going to try to do better next time. And he, he can't get rid of it. So he throws it in the temple and runs away. Did that remove his guilt? No. Willpower can't remove it. Once again, Judas takes things into his own hands. He's guilty, but he doesn't turn that guilt over to Jesus. Instead, he tries to undo his sin through his own strength. Oh, how we fall for this trap. You take a diet, right? You trust yourself. Okay, I'm going to go on a diet. I'm going to do keto diet, paleo, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you sneak a donut. 
or two like I did this morning. You regret it. So willpower, you're going to try harder next time. And then you fail. <laughs> you trust yourself. Regret, willpower. My marriage is falling apart, but you know what? We can make this work. I regret what I said, all this. I'm going to try harder next time. But then you fail. Oh, no, 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 baby, I'm sorry. I won't say those words again. It's a trap. Debt. You know, you know, that's why we're offering Financial Peace University around here, by the way, because debt is such a huge thing right now. Debt. Oh, I shouldn't have spent that. I'll try harder next time. And it's the cycle. We just go round and round and round and round and round. It doesn't work. That's kind of like, you know, trying to get through life, you know, where you're, you can't see very well. But you're trying to get through life because you can squint really good. Hope isn't found in willpower. Hope is only found by looking to Jesus. Well, let's find out the result. Verse 5. <coughs> So Judas threw the money into the temple, tried to get rid of it, didn't work. Couldn't get rid of that guilt. So what did he do? Then he went and hanged himself. So we learned on Friday night at our service Friday that spiritual blindness is deadly. And boy, is that lived out in Judas's life. You know who else's life it's lived out in? Have you seen the stats on suicide in the past six months? Especially among young people? You know, we, we look at it, 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 the guilt, the shame that he couldn't get a, give away or get away. He couldn't deal with it. He tried. He regrets it. Willpower. He trusts himself. It just led to more and more, and as you look down to it, it's shame. You know, fundamentally, guilt can be a good thing because guilt can be used by God to lead us to Jesus. But there's a problem. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is something you've done, but shame defines who you are. You are not the mistakes of your past. You are a child created in the image of God Almighty. That's your identity. Not what you've done. Not the mistakes you've made. Guilt says to us, I have done something wrong. However, shame says that there is something wrong with me. That shame is that feeling of being hopelessly broken. Like there's something hopelessly wrong with me. I'm not as good as other people. People can't know the real me because of how dark I am. That's shame. You know who wants us to, to identify ourselves by our shame? It's the enemy. And the enemy is very real. In scripture, his name was Lucifer when he was an angel. But he led a rebellion against God. His name is Satan. And him and his minions want to destroy you. So want you to identify yourselves by the mistakes you've made in your past. Because that just leads to spiritual blindness, and spiritual blindness is deadly. Well, instead of taking his guilt to Jesus to find forgiveness and hope, Judas dealt with guilt in his own strength, which resulted in overwhelming shame and hopelessness. Hope is only found by looking to Jesus. I would say, you know, there is an epidemic, there is a pandemic of shame in our culture. It's a pandemic. People trying to figure out how to make it in the chaotic, divided society where everyone is doing the best they can, but life just keeps getting more and more blurry. And so what we're going to spend the rest of this time on with the phoropter, the spiritual phoropter, as we started off with the blurry. That's how they always start with a phoropter is blurry. And then they want to help you get to the right prescription to make everything clear. So from now on, we're going to look to someone else besides Judas. We're going to look at somebody else 
who wronged Jesus. It was Peter. And from him, we're going to learn the prescription. We'll start back in Luke 22 again. Verse 54. Then seizing Jesus, they led him away. This is back to the garden. They seized Jesus, <clears throat> Garden of Gethsemane. They led him away and took him into the house of the high priest. Caiaphas was his name. Peter followed at a distance. And when some there had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard, he, sat, they, he, he had sat down together. Peter sat down with them. A servant girl saw him seated there in the firelight. She looked closely at him and said, this man was with him, but he denied it. Woman, I don't know him, he said. A little later, someone else saw him and said, hey, you, you're also one of them. Ma'am, I am not, Peter replied. About an hour later, another asserted, certainly this fellow was with him, for he is a Galilean. Peter replied, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Here's the question. Was Peter guilty? Yes, just like Judas. Judas betrayed Jesus. Well, at Jesus' darkest moment when he's being beaten and tried illegally, Peter didn't stand up for him. He didn't say, yes, I am a follower of Jesus. He denied Jesus. Peter could have embraced the same distorted eyesight as Judas of trusting himself, regret, willpower, and shame. However, Peter knew the only way to find hope for his guilt was by looking to Jesus. Why? Because Peter didn't just know about Jesus. Peter knew Jesus. And there's a big difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus personally. And we're going to find that difference as we go to John chapter 12. Verse 3, this is after the resurrection. Good Friday, this past Friday, we looked at the cross. Well, now this morning, it's after the resurrection. Why is that so significant? Well, we're going to see how the resurrection changed Peter. So they're hanging around. It's after the resurrection. They don't know what to do, kind of twiddling thumbs. And just like me, if I have a day off and I'm twiddling my thumbs, hey, let's go fishing. That's what they do. <clears throat> I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Does that sound familiar? We've been going verse by verse through John, or through Luke. Back chapter 5, they went out. They didn't catch anything all night. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples did not realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they said. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. The same exact miracle that Jesus performed in chapter 5. They were out fishing. Jesus performed this miracle and then called them to become fishers of men, to become his disciples. Jesus was recommissioning them, <laughs> recalling them. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's John, that's how he always refers to himself as, <clears throat> said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. One of my favorite moments in scripture, because it's just like one of my favorite moments in movie history, right here. That's Peter. I mean, here, here, here's Forrest Gump, and he's like, Lieutenant Dan, like his favorite person in the world. Lieutenant Dan, you got new legs, Lieutenant Dan. And he just like jumps off the boat and swims to Lieutenant Dan. That's exactly what Peter does here. He sees Jesus, and he's like, he can't even wait for them to turn the boat around and go. He just jumps. He can't wait to get to Jesus. Why? Because he knew Jesus. Judas knew about Jesus. Peter knew Jesus. 
Peter used to trust himself. He thought he knew it was best. So do all of us in this room. He knew about Jesus, but then he learned who Jesus really is. And so instead of trusting himself, he trusted Jesus. And even though he had denied Jesus three times, even though he had blown it, even though he had regrets and remorse over that, nothing is going to keep him from getting to Jesus. So many struggle to trust that God can actually forgive them. And you, might, you might feel like you've messed up so bad that God could never forgive it. Nope, not according to Scripture. Jesus just loves you. Putting on the correct lens, the lens that we read in Scripture as we've gone through all of Scripture, the lens, the correct lens, the prescription begins with realizing how much God loves you, that there is nothing you can do to earn God's love. There is nothing you can do to lose it. Do you hear that? I don't care what you've done. There's nothing you can do to lose God's love. There's nothing you can do to earn it. Don't be defined by your past. Be defined by how God looks at you. Hope is only found by looking to Jesus. Jump down to verse 15, John 21. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Okay, so Peter's a fisherman. So, so who is, what is Jesus saying? You know, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these other disciples? You know, he, Peter always claimed that boldly. Like, I love you more than anybody. That was pride. Do you love me more than these? Or was Jesus saying, do you love me more than this huge catch? 150 plus fish is what the number was. Huge payday. Do you love me more than these? Your old life as a professional fisherman? Well, this is a moment of truth. Would Peter return to his old life of trusting himself, regret, willpower, and shame? Or would he repent, surrender his guilt to Jesus, and receive restoration? Well, let's find out. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Here's the second reading on, on Peter's spiritual eyesight where Judas was filled with regret. With Peter, we zero in and it's repent. This isn't temporary regret through self-effort. This is genuine repentance out of a love for Jesus. I wanted to define, people talk about, well, you need to repent. What does repentance mean? This is what repentance is. Repentance involves a surrendered change of mind, heart, and actions. Repentance recognizes that our sin is offensive to God, but we are not going to hide it. To repent means to make an about face, a U-turn in your heart, directed turn away from yourself towards God, from the past to a future ruled by God's command, acknowledging that Jesus reigns supreme over one's existence as king. That's what it means to repent. If you want hope, you've been looking to the world's answers. How's that working? Hope is only found by looking to Jesus, repenting from those past ways. That just means turning from those past, from self to Jesus and saying, Jesus, you're my king. <coughs> Excuse me. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Real quick question. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. How many times did Jesus restore Peter? 
He restored him and gave him a new purpose of leading and feeding the church. It's not an accident. Because Jesus was displaying something here. He was communicating something. It's that third measure of spiritual eyesight in Peter's life. It wasn't willpower, trying harder and then messing up, regretting, you know, trusting self, trying harder. It wasn't that. It's not his power. It's God's power. Significant difference. This was intentional. Jesus restoring Peter three times declared, Peter, you can't restore yourself through your own strength or willpower. Instead, I'm restoring you through my divine power. That's the difference between regret and repentance. Regret is your try harder willpower. Repentance is, I can't do it, God. I can't keep myself from that behavior. I can't keep myself from talking to my wife that way. I can't keep myself from spending this. I can't keep myself from gossip. But Lord, you can give me the power to not do that. It's not willpower. It's God's power that gives us hope. So for the final measurement, we're going to go to the book of Acts. And and just to set the table here, this is after the resurrection. This is actually five weeks afterwards. Now, all the way back Good Friday, what we looked at on, on, on Friday night, Peter was afraid of a servant girl. Now, five weeks later, he is transformed because it's not his willpower. It's God's power working through him. Now he's standing before a huge crowd. And in that crowd are the very people yelling, crucify, crucify. In that crowd are Jewish leaders who were part of the the people who put Jesus on the cross. Now, if he was the same person, he'd be afraid. But he is full of the Spirit of God. He has been transformed. And now he stands before this crowd and he says this. He says, therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, (laughs) he's not afraid anymore. He's transformed. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. We're going to have a baptism here in a few minutes. Someone who has given their life to Jesus. Given their life, say, you know what? I made a mess, but Jesus gave me new life, and I want to declare it. Repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Look at the results, verse 40. (coughs) With many other words, he warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those that accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. After Peter blew it three times, he could have walked the same path as Judas and ended up just seeing life through a blurry lens of shame. Is that you? Do you just see, you're just ashamed of who you are, what you've done? God doesn't want you to feel that way. The enemy does. What God wants you to experience is what Peter experienced. He was not qualified from his mistakes to stand and represent Jesus before that crowd. But because he knew Jesus, he was qualified because of Jesus' righteousness. Therefore, he wasn't full of shame. He was full of forgiveness. He was forgiven. Being forgiven isn't just something that happens to us. It's something we walk by faith in. We can walk in forgiveness knowing our identity isn't defined by the mistakes of our past, but by the forgiveness we received because of Jesus' death and resurrection. I'm going to have the band come up. I'm also going to have Susan come up, and and she's asked Jessica to, to baptize her this morning. But baptism is a it's a drama. That's all it is. 
It's a drama written by God to demonstrate everything we've talked about this morning. And Pat's going to be involved as well. Come on up, Pat. Got our women's ministry represented well here. But what they're going to demonstrate here in this drama is that Susan is going to come over and she's going to be nervous. That's part of the drama. That represents her old life. And then the Bible says we are crucified with Christ is that Jessica and Pat are going to put her into the water. That represents her being crucified with Christ. And then she's going to come out and everybody's going to cheer their lungs out. That's part of the drama. That represents her new life now that she has new sight. So Jessica, go ahead and take it from there. Back on? There we go. Well, everyone, I want to introduce you to my friend Susan. She's amazing, and she has an incredible story. I hope one day you get to hear the whole thing. But we have have just a couple of questions for you, because Jesus found you when you were in the hospital dying. Can you give us, like, the Cliff Notes version of what happened? Um, Well, my daughters tried to make a decision one night, and they decided to wait another night. And that night... Jesus came, and he surrounded me with love, hope, a love I'd never felt before, peace, joy. He filled my body. It was so wonderful, so beautiful. As the morning came, I was healed. I felt glorious. Thank you, Jesus. Right? So Jesus already saved you. There's nothing magic about this water. This baptism doesn't save you, but it's still incredibly special and an act of obedience. So why did you want to get baptized today? Well, like you said, Jesus has already saved me. I uh, want to accept his gift to us, the Holy Spirit. That's why. (laughs) Yes and amen. Well, we're going to let you step into this water. I can't tell you how appropriate it is to have a baptism on the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. Is that awesome? So Susan, you can, you can make your way to get dry, follow that way. But as she goes, I, I had a funny conversation on, on Friday because, you know, most of you know the story, like I thought I was fine and and I got my glasses, and they said I need a prescription. I'm like, I don't need a prescription. And, and I, I, I said, so fine, I'll get glasses. So I order the glasses, and they come in the mail. And I'm like, yeah, maybe I'll wear them every once in a while, right? And I'm like, whatever. So I get them, and all of a sudden, I turn them on, and I, I put them on, and I was like, everybody looks great, crisp, clear, I can see. And so I told this story a, a couple weeks ago. And then Nick Forsay, and he, he, he was here at the 8 o'clock service. Nick comes to me on, on Good Friday. He goes, Brian, man, I got a bone to pick with you. I'm like, what? He's like, oh, you told that story. And I was like, yeah. And, and he said, he said they, you get the prescription. You needed it. You weren't going to wear them. He said, yeah. He said, I did that 10 years ago. He went to the optometrist 10 years ago, and they gave him a prescription 
for these glasses he has never worn. And so he was at his, you know, working at his desk and he's like he kind of squinting and having a headache. And all of a sudden he remembered my story. And he's like, oh, stupid Brian. So he, he, he goes, okay, fine. So he goes over, he finds these glasses in the closet. And he's like, sits down, he's like, you know, whatever. And he just goes like this. And he goes, Foo. And all of a sudden he could see. He said it was like there was like a weight lifted off his head. <laughs> And he said this, he said, Brian, here was the important thing. The whole time the solution was right in front of me. But because I was stubborn, I just kind of left it there. Is that you? Listen, the Lord doesn't just want to give you new glasses. He doesn't even want to just do LASIK. What he wants to do is give you new eyeballs. And you can, just like Susan... You can accept Jesus right now. Go ahead and just close your eyes. Man, if that's you, if that's you, if you want, you want to accept him, you want to accept that gift that he died in your place and you want to accept that life and say, Jesus, you're my king. If you want to accept that, just raise your hand right now. Everybody's eyes are closed and I'll pray with you. If you've been living for yourself, trying to get through things, self-power, self-willpower, and you know <laughs> you may be a Jesus follower, but you've been following your own path, I want to give you the chance right now as, as we sing this last song, make this song a prayer, a cry of your heart that just says, Lord, forgive me for trusting myself, that endless cycle of regret, of willpower, of shame. Lord, I give all that to you. Jesus, I surrender it to you. And just like you did with Peter, take it, Lord, and remove it as far as the east is from the west. I live for you in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and make the song of prayer.